The legal regulation of information acquisition and disclosure is a vast and complex area comprising intellectual property and much, much more. But today, I want to talk first about three dichotomies, the first two of which are captured in the following two by two table. The columns in this table represent two different ways in which information is acquired. Some things we learn through effort, such as the intricacies of tax law. This type of information is deliberately acquired. Other pieces of information we come to know without much, if any, effort. Casually acquired information is information that's difficult not to know. It doesn't take much effort to know that there's a country called the United States of America. Indeed, it re would require a considerable amount of effort not to know this fact. Tony Cronman, uh, who by the way taught me bankruptcy a long time ago, he emphasized the difference between deliberately and casually acquired information because we can require the disclosure of casually acquired information without much risk that the potential discloser will remain willfully ignorant. That's not the case with deliberately acquired information. If we force, for example, sellers of used cars to disclose what they know about their car before selling it, we might expect that these sellers will not take the steps to acquire the information in the first place. So back to the table. The rows of the table represent two different effects of information disclosure. Sometimes the disclosure of information will, will create value by uh, allowing uh, the recipient of the new information to take better care or make better allocative choices of what to buy or sell. Disclosure of information in the stock market might lead to more accurate prices that might cause money to ultimately flow to more appropriate investments. This would be value enhancing information. In contrast, other types of information do not increase value, but merely affect how the value is distributed among people. This would be redistributive information. Bob Cooter and Tom Eulen, by the way, I routinely used to beat Tom Eulen in racquetball, uh, they emphasize this distinction because we might want to encourage the acquisition of value increasing information and actively discourage the acquisition of redistributive information because it merely redistributes value and then costs money to acquire off it. The individual cells in this table include examples of these four permutations created by this two by two box. KFC's secret recipe uh, represents a trade secret that was deliberately acquired by the corporation, I guess by Colonel Sanders, and which enhances the value of the chicken. A home buyer might want to know the, uh, that the seller needs a hospital operation uh, solely uh, because uh, knowing this would give the buyer um, an ability to demand a lower price. The guy uh, needs uh, cash quick to do the operation. This kind of information might be deliberately acquired to search for this, uh, but it would be redistributive because its a main effect is just changing the price at which you'd buy the house. Uh, hearing about the War of 1812 ending is a reference to Laidlaw versus Oregon, a Supreme Court case which uh, Tony Cronman argued involved casually acquired information because one of the litigants just happened to hear an early report that the Treaty of Ghent had just been signed ending the War of 1812. The news is value enhancing in the sense that it might cause better allocative investments. In that case, hogsheads of tobacco, these are hogsheads of tobacco, uh, were rolling, uh, were rotting on the docks of uh, New Orleans because of the British blockade. But because the war was ending, the blockade was about to be lifted. Can you guess what is about to happen to the New Orleans price of tobacco? Finally, 
uh, a dealership's knowledge of its own markup is casually acquired information because it'd be hard for a dealership not to know the price at which it purchased the car and, and the price at which it's selling the car. Disclosing the markup to consumers would be primarily redistributive, be possibly in allowing the consumers to bargain uh, for a larger share of the gains of trade. A final dichotomy emphasized by Steve Chevelle uh, with regard to information disclosure is tied to contracting. As a descriptive matter, the law is much more likely to require sellers to disclose information than to require that buyers disclose information. Thus, while the phrase caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, is better known, the phrase caveat venditor, let the seller beware, is more relevant when it comes to undisclosed information. A landlord might have to disclose that someone previously died in an apartment, but a renter usually need not disclose that she had previously been convicted of murder. So what are the possible ways that the law can regulate the disclosure of information? If you think the answer is uh, that the law has to choose between mandate disclosure or not, uh, you're way off base. Here are five possible uh, uh, regimes uh, where the law can uh, affect disclosure. It can uh, prohibit disclosure. Uh, the law, uh, of course, prohibits the disclosure of classified uh, security information. In my lecture on the veil of ignorance, I uh, suggested context that keeping decision makers in the dark can lead to less biased de decision making. That's why uh, we prohibit students from disclosing their names on exams. Uh, uh, we uh, alternatively might prohibit just the credible disclosure of information. And this more subtly, the law sometimes allows disclosure but undermines the credibility of any claims. This is one effect of the secret ballot. Uh, I could tell uh, the president, I promise I voted for you, but talk is cheap and non-credible because I can't verify uh, that I in fact did. And another kind of legal regime is laissez-faire. Uh, under a laissez-faire regime, it allows the possessor of information to decide whether to disclose or not. This uh, might or might not include full freedom of contract in which the possessor of information commits in advance whether to maintain confidentiality or uh, disclose to the public or to particular people. And another regime would be to mandate disclosure of what you know. The law requires pharmaceutical companies, for example, to disclose adverse events about their pharmaceuticals uh, about which they become aware. The important limitation here, th though, is that the companies only have to disclose what they know. And finally, the most supercharged kind of disclosure regime is a mandate to disclose what you know or should have known. This is, uh, this is mandatory disclosure on steroids. It requires disclosing what you uh, should have known, uh, th that kind of requirement responds to the concern of willful ignorance. Uh, if you require used car sellers to disclose uh, what a mechanic tells them is wrong with their car, they're likely again to avoid uh, taking their car to a mechanic before selling. But if you require them to disclose what they should have known uh, and they should have known what a mechanic tells them, you can avoid the problem of deliberately non-acquired information. So for discussion, which of these legal regimes is best deployed uh, in each of the permutations described above, including with regard to buyers and sellers? P.S. You can hear about a hypothetical where a professor selling a car tries to remain uninformed in my lecture about the ex-ante and ex-post distinction.